I'm going to start by bringing in as panelists for amazing teachers from our program. I am honored to know them as teachers. I'm honored to call them colleagues. I love getting to call them friends. Um, let's see, it's gonna take me just a second to find them on the list. Dan, help me with this. Um, you know what? Dan's- You got it, I'm gonna do it. Bring them all in and then I'm gonna introduce them. Stephanie Hendricks, a teacher from Bangor, Maine. Um, Stephanie Holmes, let me tell you how confusing it is when I thought I could call everybody Stephanie H in my planner and then I realized I was inundated with Stephanie H's. Stephanie Holmes, teacher from Oakland, California. Tim Brendler, those of you who are with us for summer camp know him as Bat Tim. That's a story. Spider Dan was the other big one. So if at any point you really wanna feel like an insider, Spider Dan and Bat Tim. Tim and the amazing inimitable Dr. Emily Sines, both from Fort Worth, Texas. So thank you all so much for being here. You're all in as panelists now. I'm gonna ask you to turn off. Um, Dan, I'm gonna give you another task, make them all co-hosts uh, in the next couple minutes. I'm you got it. Turn off your cameras and I will call you up one at a time over the next little while. So we are calling this section classroom ready curriculum using the METS materials in live virtual and hybrid settings. And this is partly because um, we decided that if the powers that be found out we were calling it curriculum, they might get mad at us. They might want us to have a more formal, a more formal title. So, but you know, there really is something to that. We are in this world where every single person on here is having to confront something they've never had to confront before as a teacher, except you know, like in March and April and May. Um, from week to week, we don't know whether we're live. We don't know whether we're virtual. Maybe we're hybrid. So, in response to that, we at MetEd have tried to come up with a refurbished, a rethought out curriculum that can be applied to any of those settings. And if I were to sum up our curriculum this year, I think I'd use one word and that word is choice. From a practical perspective, um, the activities we're preparing can appeal to as wide a range of ages, experience levels um, and interests as possible. Um, an amazing takeaway from summer camp was that we, had, we thought we were gonna head down to eight year olds doing this we had three and a half year olds who sat through Cosi Fan Tutte. I have never sat through Cosi Fan Tutte without being really fidgety. We had a three and a half year old who sat through Cosi Fan Tutte. Kids can get really into opera. Um, and Ashley, one of our teachers earlier in this conversation made a comment about having her enjoying music class. And I love that idea. Like anybody, no matter what your experience level is, you can come in and you can enjoy opera. So again, age, experience level, interest, doesn't matter, we got something for you. Um, from a pedagogical perspective, the necessity of choice is to provide sort of a trauma-informed care. Um, Lori put a comment in the chat earlier about the necessity of caring for the mental health of our students. You know, we've talked so much today about our own mental health, um, but it's a whole other level of challenge to try to take care of the mental health of students who we may not even be seeing in person, and yet somehow we are responsible for their happiness and continued well-being and their social and emotional learning, even as the world falls to pieces around us. So the idea is that if we can give kids choice, that will help them feel like they are in control. And finally, choice from sort of a philosophical perspective is that we want opera to be able to be explored from myriad angles. Um, and it can, if you're a student, it can be a springboard for whatever strikes your fancy. Um, Again, just a couple of comments we had in the chat box earlier, Christy talking about, actually this was not in the chat box, this was live, Christy talking about students saying, can I keep working on this more at home? And so maybe your students are stuck at home anyway, maybe they're in the classroom so, and then they're going home and bored because they can't go out and play with other kids. So how do we construct a curriculum that helps kids be who they are, helps kids discover who they are, um, and in a way that makes them feel safe and seen and heard. Uh, a couple more quotes that I absolutely loved. Pat's comment about connecting, responding and creating together. Uh, Jen's comment about this is a time to slow down and branch out. Oh my goodness, yes. The branching out I've been doing preparing this curriculum has been so much fun. Um, Susan talking about this is a time to engage in creativity. And in terms of creative curriculum, in terms of a slowing down and branching out curriculum. In terms of this word I use 
all the time, interdisciplinarity. Um, just to give you a sense, the operas we're talking about this week and next, so that's Fidelio, Fio de Regiment, Akhenaten, and Dr. Atomic. Here are some of the, uh, uh, the disciplines, here are some of the classroom subjects that our amazing teachers who are writing these activities have been able to draw into studies of these operas. Um, the most obvious, of course, is music, music theory, composition, but also improvisation, uh, history, archaeology and anthropology, Native American and indigenous studies, literature, poetry, creative writing, dance and movement, critical thinking, game theory and economics, uh, and law, ethics and debate. And that's just to name a few. That was the call down list I was able to come up with. And as always, we are making our signature educator guides available to anyone who is interested in them, whether you're a teacher, whether you're an opera fan, whether you know nothing about opera, but kind of think you might want to be a fan, so you're going to go read about it. Uh, and these are available on our website completely free of charge. I am going to show you where to find that. Um, if you go to um, medopera.org slash education, actually that's back here. If you go to medopera.org slash education, you end up here. This, by the way, is Anthony Rothkastanza, who'll be joining us next week. Scroll down, click on HD Live in Schools, and then keep scrolling down. Here you have each of the operas we are doing this year, and click on it, and it will give you the educator guide. At this point, only two of them have been published. The next ones are coming in a couple of weeks. Also, for anybody who was curious about applying to be an official member of the program, the HD Live in Schools program, that's what this nifty apply now button is for. Um, let me close that. Um, so that again is available completely free of charge to anybody who wants to, who has the ability to just navigate to the MET's website. Um, our other big guiding principle this year is let's make things as easy as possible for teachers. You know what none of us need is somebody saying, let me make this more complicated. So we're trying to prepare things that can go straight to your students. Um, and with that in mind, we are doing something we have literally never done before in MET education, which is that we are using Google Docs. Now, for those of you who are in the HD Live in Schools program already, you're going to be getting an email next week with all the information you need to access those Google Docs. Note that you have to have a Google-based account to be able to do that. So whether it's an account ending in at gmail.com or an account ending in at uh, Opera is awesome at schooldistrict.edu. As long as it's based in the Google platform, you'll be able to access it. Um, even if you don't use Google Classroom with your students, you can still go in there. You can extract all of the activities. They all come with everything you need, the uh, PDFs of scores, the um, any links you need to click on. It's all already in there. So it's in, contained in one super easy uh, accessible package. I am going to share this one as well, just very quickly, because um, part of what's really exciting to me about this, and again, this will all be in your email, you're going to get telling you how to deal with it. When you get access to this classroom, make a copy of it and then use that copy to distribute to your teachers. Um, please don't change anything in the original. Um, you are completely welcome to adjust the activities, to add things, to subtract things. But again, do that in your copy of it, um, not in the original classroom. Uh, once you're in here, if you click on classwork, we have organized all these topics by opera. Uh, we have Fidelio and Fio de Regiment at the top. You'll see there are a couple that are still in draft form. Um, don't worry about those. Once they're ready to go, the little draft thing will disappear. So just don't worry about those. Um, but the other super exciting thing is that if you click on stream, there's this space where you teachers can all talk to each other. Again, this is only going to be open to teachers um, who are part of the program and teachers uh, who want to be able to talk to each other. You're like your individual district classroom will be a copy of this. I'm not gonna be in here monitoring it. I'm not a call monitor, so behave appropriately. Um, but it is a place where if there's a great uh, resource you discover, you can totally come in and put that in there. Uh, there was a comment earlier about a Met education cookbook. If you have a recipe you really need to share, you know what, we would love to see it. So this is a space for you to keep talking to each other. It's a space for you to keep communicating. Um, and with that in mind, uh, here's Pretty Yende. Quick note, when you copy it, she won't copy with it. So I'm gonna include that, that picture for you to keep using. 
Um, all right, and that is closed. So with that in mind, um, so we have Google Classroom, we have the Met Education stuff online, but there are so many other resources for teachers working um, remotely in hybrid settings. And to introduce some of our favorites, can I have Mr. Tim Brendler turn his video on, come back on screen. Tim, you should have screen sharing capabilities. Yes, you do. So I am going to say goodbye and throw it over to Tim. Awesome. Hi, friends. Uh, we are so excited uh, that you are with us. Um, we are really excited. This I have a ton to share with you, uh, and I'm going to try to do my best and make it really, really quick. So it's going to be a little bit of word vomit. Um, and so bear with me. I'm going to send you a hyperlink with all these resources, uh, and then we're going to do a really fun menti together before I pass the torch to my other fabulous colleagues. Um, so many of you know me. I'm uh, Tim Brenler or Timmy B uh, by my students and colleagues. Um, but enough about me, and let's dive in. You'll see on uh, all of our educator resources, we're always going to have a philosophical chairs um, activity. And this is one of my favorite things to introduce our students to the operas. Um, and what it is, is just a variety of deliberately open ended statements for students to react to and discuss. And we'll play with this in just a second. And it's really important to note that philosophical chairs is a discussion and not a debate. And ideally, this activity would be done in person, students facing each other. However, we don't necessarily live in an ideal world right now. So students have a moment to read, ask clarifying questions, and then quickly decide whether they agree or disagree with that statement. So you'll see here there are a few little ground rules that are helpful when you're in your classroom. And I particularly like the last one, the three before me rule, meaning three other people have to talk before you can talk again. So here's an example of what your in-class setup might look like, but I know many, many, many of us are still te either teaching remotely or in a hybrid scenario. So there are a few ways you may engage with philosophical chairs with your students available on different platforms, such as Mentimeter, which we looked at earlier, and we're gonna dive into that in just a moment, Pear Deck and Kahoot. And for each of these, once you set these up, students log in with the code and that program generates um, for them to log in. So first, I'd like to preach the gospel of Mentimeter. Uh, this platform has completely changed the way my students engage in class. Um, this was used by a lot of corporations, and now we're seeing it being integrated more and more into the classroom each and every day. So like I said in a little bit, we're going to participate in one together. I am completely hooked, and I think you will be too as soon as we dive into this. Another option is Pear Deck, which is a Google Slides add-on. Uh, in which students log in with a generated code and one of the prompts allows them to drag their icon to the position on the screen that represents their stance on a particular philosophical chair's statement. Students will see the screen on the right and there's also a teacher version that shows each of the students individual responses which you see on the left. On a quick side note, I really love Pear Deck because it has a number of stock social emotional slides to check in with students, uh, which is always important but now more so than ever when many of our students are learning virtually from home. Kahoot is a uh, really uh, neat thing that's set up like a video game, awarding points for how fast you respond. This has actually changed a lot over the years. Um, it's a really great option, particularly for younger students if you're really looking for like a game setting. But before we dive into our mentee, there are a few other educational technology platforms that I want you to be aware of. Um, shout out to our friend earlier who talked about Flipgrid. Um, this is also another platform that has changed my life in the past month or so. Uh, Flipgrid is a really great digital resource that's gaining a lot of popularity right now. Uh, it's a really great way for students to share their voices with others, whether it's publicly or privately. Students create a video, add a number of filters, text, paint, stickers, emojis, and they also include a sticky note for feature for students to write down their notes or text so they don't forget what they want to say. Uh, and it'll show on their screen, but not on the video they produce. And it's really not just about recording videos, it's really about making sure that learning is a social, personal, and accessible experience for all of our students. So it's such a great tool for making connections, exploring a topic in greater depth, and promoting the idea that everyone's a teacher and everyone's a learner. And after submitting a video, students can watch and comment on each other's videos. And what I really love about Flipgrid is that you can also link everything of their, all of their videos. You can download a QR code, which is really great for like back to school nights, whether that's in person or virtual. You can just create all sorts of QR codes to share with your, um, with your students and families. So here's an example of a 90 second opera review activity, which is one of a number of Flipgrid activities our global summer campers engaged in this past summer. Uh, and we've had a lot of success with different uh, Flipgrids. 
And so whenever you're submitting your Flipgrid, I really recommend taking off the viewing counts so that no one's ego is, is squashed um, when they're looking at that. Uh, this year, I'm having my AP Music Theory students create six different 10-minute podcasts or video blogs throughout the year. And Flipgrid's an easy way that's a really accessible platform for them to complete this assignment as it has a built-in editor into the platform itself. It's especially great since students never have trouble submitting videos since they record and submit directly through Flipgrid, and there's no need to save and upload to a different platform. And let me tell you, that has been such a godsend to not have to respond to a million different tech inquiries every day. And if this is something that really interests you, the Met has two podcasts, Aria Code and In Focus, that are incredible resources that your students will really, really enjoy. Uh, next week, we'll have the opportunity to chat with Akhenaten star ARC, whose interview with Terry Gross on NPR's Fresh Air last year turned out to be an incredible catalyst for deep and meaningful conversations with my students. So I highly recommend you share and discuss this interview with your students if you'll be teaching Akhenaten this year. I've also used Google Sites to have my students host their podcast. In a matter of five minutes, every one of my students was able to create their own website. And I think it's single-handedly the most user-friendly website building platform or blog creator I've ever come across. Uh, Goose Chase is one of my all-time favorite platforms to use, which allows you to build your own photo scavenger hunts. And students download the app, enter the code for the game you created, and begin completing the different missions. And so over the next week, we want each of you to join a special Goose Chase that I've created for this year's conference, uh, which Emily's going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, and the photos you upload, we're going to be compiling to create a special Met Education Family slideshow, and we'll share that with the Goose Chase instructions and join code a little bit later on. Uh, this year has definitely been the year of learning curves for teachers, whether this is year 5, 25, or 45. It feels like we're all first-year teachers again, uh, and many of you have likely created your own virtual classrooms, and part of mine includes a Met Opera virtual classroom page which I have created and I'm going to share with you on a resource page a little bit later that you can make a copy of and create and share it in your own spaces. Uh, all of the Bitmojis that you see are hyperlinked to behind the scenes clips from the Met and each of the characters you see seated here are hyperlinked to all of our illustrated synopses. Uh, another thing, a meme maker, what started as an assignment for my students to promote our school is actually turning into an opera assignment where students are going to have to uh, go on to meme maker and summarize an opera through the point of view of a character of their choice solely using memes. Um, so the website is listed above and I've also included it uh, in my handout. Another thing we use this summer, uh, there's tons of different resources online for downloadable Jeopardy templates, but I think this one from Youth Downloads is one of my favorites. Uh, we used it with Global Summer Camp with great success, and I think it's one of the best templates uh, that I've ever seen out there. Um, this is a ton of different resources. Uh, I wish I could take credit for creating this, uh, but people who are far smarter than me <laughs> compiled all these. So here are a number of other tools that have been an enormous help to me, and I hope that you'll be able to say the same too. Uh, it takes a lot of time to go through each of these resources, but I promise you, you won't regret a single minute of the time you invest in checking these out. Uh, your students will love engaging with all of these various different plas um, platforms. And in a time that has teachers thinking completely outside the box, I'd really encourage you to let your creativity fly. Try things you normally wouldn't do. Some things may stick, others may not. Uh, and just like this year's Met Ed curriculum, that is, this is the year of choice. Allow your students to choose from a different type of platform uh, that they're most comfortable with to respond, engage with. Um, that is going to be really exciting. So if you have questions or want to follow up regarding any of the content, I'm going to put in the chat a number of different links uh, that are going to um, like a Dropbox link to so you can see all these things. Uh, but before I pass the torch, I would love for you to go back to Mentimeter. So go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and enter the code 4252550 for a sneak peek into all the marvelous things that Menti can do, as well as what this year's Met Opera Education season has in store. So I'm going to drop this in the chat in just a second. And then I'm going to pull that up as well. So you can also just click the link that I uh, put in there. And here is our mentee. I'd really encourage you to um, do it on a phone if you have a phone so that you don't have to go between the two screens. 
Um, that way, what you're going to see on your phone is not going to be the same necessarily as the screen. What I love here on the bottom right hand side is there are actually reactions you can include with your mentee. Um, so I see many of you giving us some great hearts. So here is a little bit of how um, I have created uh, our Philosophical Chairs virtual edition using Mentimeter. Here we go. Oh, and also remind your students at the top if they're ever logging in after you start, the login code is always going to appear at the top of that page. So agree or disagree, I'd sacrifice everything for love. And each of these statements that you'll see in philosophical chairs uh, that I've created are going to go along with a theme um, that, that is a big part of each of those productions. Um, and you can always uh, remind your students to just go with their gut instinct. And I'm going to create this uh, and share this with you so that uh, if you have colleagues that just want to check it out, and I'm going to put this into um, a different mode so that you can go back and see this and share this with others. Agree or disagree, you are a product of your upbringing. And you can see each of the different productions that we are going to uh, be studying this year. Um, you'll see the pictures from one of those productions. Uh, we're just really excited for this incredible season that we have here. You can also see that uh, there's a ton of, ton of different um, slides you can create, different ways and different ways to sort of visually see a lot of these answers. Uh, if I took to the throne today, my first edict would be, so thinking of with Akhenaten this year, this is just a free response question. Uh, so you can do more things than just um, multiple choice. Um, questions. There's all sorts of different things. And I really love this one, especially. Oh, I love that pay raise for educators preach. <laughs> and this is just the really exciting thing. So I'm going to keep scrolling down so we can see more of our responses here. Oh, yes, I love this. Mental health days are allowed for sick days. Oh my gosh, run for president, please. I love all the things you're saying about healthcare right now. I love that. I love that. I love that. Susan would hand out Prosecco vouchers. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I love this. Awesome. Alrighty. Identify where you stand with regards to the following statements. Uh, I will just give a disclaimer. The ones that I've created for Dr. Atomic, uh, some of them are, are pretty intense. Um, and what I think is really interesting about this particular one, so you have a slider on your screen um, and you'll be able to start seeing some of the responses of just what the average is. Um, and what I really like about the slider, it gives them a little bit more option than just either I agree or disagree. Uh, so they can sort of have a middle of the road. And what I think is really interesting, Kamala and I were talking about Dr. Atomic, is that there's such a huge um, flux of just this dichotomy of just like this absolutely horrific thing, but also this sort of beautiful triumph of science uh, when we talk about just like the sheer intelligence that went into creating that. Um, so just a, a fair warning about those that there's a lot of questions and statements about that that are going to talk about ethics and it's really important that I think students know the history behind a lot of that, uh, which we'll talk about at a later uh, session. The cast of The Merry Widow remind us to dance our cares away. So tell us, what is one of your favorite songs to dance to? And so earlier, I had to scroll through those myself. But as you start to um, put these in here, um, I am not going to need to scroll. So this one is actually going to start scrolling. Once it populates, you'll start to see I'm not having to do anything um, with that. And it should just start moving in just a second. Um, but I really love this part. Um, that is just a really cool thing for our students to engage with. Um, again, this is really great. I've been doing this before virtual learning, but now that we are in the virtual realm, this has just been a really, really incredible tool uh, for my students and I. Agree or disagree, your family should have a say in who you marry. This one has especially been a hot topic. I've used this statement before, and it's always so neat for our students to um, engage with these and to the conversations that they have, I think, are just so enlightening. And whatever you can do to always bring it back into the opera, uh, this is such a great introductory activity. Agree or disagree, this is one of my, this comes from uh, The Sorrows of Young Werther, uh, one of my all time, all time favorite um, operas. Uh, the mind can control the heart. Uh, I'm really, really excited for just the awesome conversations and activities that we're going to be doing with this particular opera uh, and to see how our students are going to engage in that way. Uh, here's our next one. 
Which of the following do you think is the most romantic? Flowers, homemade sweets, writing and performing a song for someone, sneaking out to profess your love on the moonlight, or one of my personal ones, my significant other allowing me to sleep in? For me, that is the most romantic thing uh, and something my fabulous husband let me do today. Um, so here is our next one. Agree or disagree, revenge may be justified. Um, it's so interesting to hear young people's sort of perspective on some of these. Um, and what I'm just, again, I just think this is such a great activity for, for students to really discuss um, all sorts of different things. Uh, and we have just a couple more. Agree or disagree, you cannot escape your past. Uh, these last two uh, productions that Kamala is going to introduce us to in the spring are some pretty heavy hitters, <laughs> um, but ones that uh, don't really get all the limelight all the time uh, with the spotlight. So we're really excited to be able to engage with some of these, um, these more uh, modern operas as well. And one last, thing. we did a word cloud earlier, but if you can have one word or phrase that would capture what you think opera is all about, uh, throw that in there and we'll see that word cloud. But a really neat thing that I also love about Menti is just how much you can create this uh, and make it visually engaging. You'll see every single slide that I uh, created has a different background um, with each of these. Uh, so it's an incredible tool. There is a basic version that is totally free for you to use. Um, if you just pay a little bit more, you can have all the bells and whistles. Um, but if you can get your educators, um, excuse me, if you can get your administration to sign off on this, uh, it is probably one of the best investments um, that you can do. So thank you all so much for participating in that. My colleagues have some incredible things that they're going to share with you. Uh, and before I sign off, I'm going to put in um, a bit.ly into the link here. Um, this bit.ly, bit.ly slash metedtech is going to be a Dropbox link to a number of the different resources, especially that huge document with all sorts of different things. And I'm going to touch base uh, during Emily's uh, spiel, and I'm going to show you uh, the PDF of some of the goose chase instructions. I'm so excited uh, about that. So who's next? I was on mute, you couldn't hear me singing Tim's praises, but you could see me lifting up my hands. Um, Tim Brendler, it is always such a joy to see what you do with this material. And just for the record, I was doing the mentees and that was really fun. Um, also, some of them really made me think. So that is a huge collection of materials, things you can do with your students. Um, and just some really great ways to start talking about the issues that are at the core of these operas, the issues and the ideas and thinking about how they connect to the modern world. Um, for the rest of our time, and we are running a little bit over, um, at three o'clock we were supposed to start sort of the community wrap up. This section is probably going to run until about 3.10. Our teachers have phenomenal resources, some phenomenal activities, so stick around with us through that. Um, and we promised you that today was going to be Fidelio and Fille du Regiment Day. So that is where we are going to turn now. We have two activities about Fidelio and one activity about Fille. Uh, we've never actually done Fidelio for the HD Live in Schools program before. And we're going to be getting a, uh, an illustrated synopsis. It's not done yet, but that will be coming. But in the meantime, just in case there's anybody who is not familiar with the plot of Fidelio, I'm going to do something that we inaugurated. This was inspired, by the way, Susan Blackwell by 60 Second Life Story. We started doing 60 Second uh, Opera synopses in the spring when we started doing our free student streams. Um, so I'm gonna start with a 60 second synopsis. Dan, Marshall, if I can have you turn your video on and be prepared to time me. A uh, quick word of warning, these are usually possible only because I'm a New Yorker and I talk very quickly. So buckle your seatbelts. Hey, Marsha. Um, uh, so, Dan, turn on, unmute yourself, let me know when you're ready. I'm ready when you are. This is a 60 second synopsis of Fidelio. Ready? That Give me a countdown. Go. So the jailer Rocco's daughter Marcelina is in love with Rocco's new employee, Fidelio, but she can't understand why Fidelio is just not interested in her advances. Unbeknownst to her, Fidelio isn't actually Fidelio at all. He is a young woman named Leonor, whose husband, the political revolutionary Florissant, has been imprisoned without cause by the sadistic reactionary prison governor, Don Pizarro. So Leonor has dressed as a man and taken a job at the prison to save her husband, but searches she might, she can't find him. Then 30 seconds. 
Ah. Then she overhears Pizarro telling Rocco that the governor minister Don Fernando is on his way to the prison. And in the prison's deepest, darkest cell, there languishes a friend of Fernando's. Spoiler alert, it's Florestan. And if Fernando finds out that Pizarro imprisoned this fellow without cause, Pizarro is going to be in deep doo-doo. So Pizarro has decided to take care of the situation by killing Florestan and leaving Leonor to hatch a desperate plan to save her husband from Pizarro's dastardly plot. Uh. That's it? You're uh. Done. Done. Yeah. Seven seconds left, five seconds. Oh my God. Oh, well then I will just say with my remaining five seconds that um, I will not spoil things for you by telling you how she saves him. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but I will let you know that no less a cantankerous drama, drama critic than Richard Wagner, yes, that Richard Wagner, found the scene Leonard jumps out brandishing a pistol to save her husband from Don Pizarro. He found that to be one of the greatest dramatic scenes ever written. So oh. there you have it. He wasn't short on opinions, Wagner. <laughs> no, he really wasn't. Um, and of his various opinions, this is one of the less problematic ones. But yeah, so there, he loved it. Pretty much the whole 19th century went crazy over this scene. The scene when the Amato Soprano wearing the pants leapt out waving a pistol to reveal her true self. Um, in fact, in 1860 in Paris, one mezzo soprano went so far as to jump out brandishing two pistols. Um, I could see Susan Blackwell doing that in the role. I'm just gonna say it. <laughs> Susan Blackwell would make a great Fidelio. Susan Blackwell, keep that in mind. Um, Nobody wants to hear me sing that, but thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna hide. Pistols first. Bye. Um, so anyway, as, thank you, Dan. Um, so as we move into one of our Fidelio uh, activities, is going to dive into the sort of the strange genre that this opera fills uh, in the history of opera. And as we listen to, um, as we find out about this activity, I just want you to keep a couple things in your head. First of all, the time when this opera was, was written. Uh, I'm getting to the end of the day, I can't differentiate my R's and my W's anymore. So the time when this opera was written, um, 1770, Beethoven is born. Um, 1789, just about the time that Beethoven, uh, sh just shy of 20 years old, is moving to Vienna, revolution breaks out in Paris. And within a few years, heads are literally going to roll. Napoleon starts marching across the continent. Um, 1804, Fidelio is all set to premiere. Four, uh, excuse me, seven days before it does, Napoleon's armies invade Vienna. The Fidelio premiere does actually go on, but nobody's in a really celebratory mood. So it closes pretty quickly. Um, and then in 1814, when the revised version of Fidelio, which is usually the one that's performed today, is premiered, it's happening during the Congress of Vienna. So every single point of the creation of this opera, seismic changes are taking place in the socio-political landscape of Europe. Um, and Beethoven was not unaware of these. He was deeply invested in politics. Um, he actually wrote a huge number of choral pieces responding to the political events of the day. We, we don't really know many of them um, in the modern world, but he was very interested in politics. Maybe more of us are familiar with the story about him wanting to call his third symphony the Napoleon Symphony, but then when Napoleon crowned himself emperor, he angrily scratched Napoleon's name off the cover of the manuscript and decided to call it simply the heroic symphony instead. Um, and also keep in mind that we talk about Fidelio as Beethoven's only opera. So it's really this anomaly in his career. In fact, Beethoven was very interested in opera. He started a lot of them. Um, some of the subjects were he was going to write an opera based on Macbeth. He was going to write an opera about Attila the Hun. He was going to write an opera about Romulus and Remus. What about Alexander the Great uh, conquering India? And yet the only one that he actually brought to completion was this opera Fidelio about a revolutionary, which was itself a revision of a French opera, um, part of the rescue opera genre, which was intimately connected to revolutionary political ideas in France at the time. So with that in mind, would Stephanie Holmes from Oakland, could you make yourself visible, turn on your video? I will. Hello. Are. Hello, thank you. Here I are. Here you are. Um, all right, I'm gonna step out and let you talk to us. All right, and I am going to share my screen. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Uh, share. 
Okay, and then, oh, I'm sharing the wrong thing. Of course I am, because I'm on the hook. So let me try that again. You guys are all familiar, I'm sure, with sharing issues. Okay. Share, share, share. Here we go. Still not sharing. That's a shame. I'm going to give it one more try. There we go. Hello, I am Stephanie Holmes. I am coming to you from San Francisco, California. I teach in Oakland, California. Um, I think this is my eighth year with the Met Opera, but don't worry about all that. I wanna to talk to you about Fidelio. So um, Fidelio, like Dr. Kamala said, is a rescue opera. And like she was saying, Beethoven was very interested in opera, but it wasn't exactly his jam. He did a lot of revision. There was a lot of stuff going on. Even Beethoven can't be Beethoven at everything. Fidelio is the only Beto uh, opera that Beethoven completed, which we just talked about. It remains in the, the genre because of the amazing music, because it's Beethoven, um, especially the overture. Maybe our students can write a better libretto. Rescue opera is a genre that was popular during the late 18th century and early 19th century in France and Germany. Like the name suggests, rescue operas generally deal with an innocent person heroically freed from wrongful captivity. These operas first became popular in France following the French Revolution. Post-aristocratic, patriotic, and idealistic themes such as resistance to oppression, secularism, and political power of individuals and people working together were popular. Fidelio is the most famous example of a rescue opera. In this activity, I invite you to write your own libretto to your own rescue opera. With many changes in Europe in the 18th century and early 19th century, including the French Revolution, Beethoven was inspired by the ideals of liberty, equality, and brotherhood. In 1804, he turned his attention to writing an opera, Fidelio, which would celebrate courage in the face of tyranny and freedom from oppression. By this time, Beethoven's hearing had begun deteriorating even more. The problem worsened until he became completely deaf in his late 40s, and as a result, often withdrew himself from society. However, even with complete deafness, Beethoven continued conducting, composing, and performing. It was during this time that he had his most creative period yet and writing his groundbreaking Symphony No. 9, which was inspired by a poem about joy and the choral mass Misa Solemnis. I have my students write a, a concert report every semester, and usually we write it on a live concert. There are no live concerts going on, so my students have been going on to YouTube, and one of my general music students, his name is Stanley, he happened on a performance of Daniel Berenborn doing Beethoven 9. And in his concert report, his conclusion was, oh, to freaking joy, OMG. And I just thought, yep, Stanley gets it, Stanley gets it. All right, materials. Like everybody's been saying, boy, do we have to be flexible. So whatever you got, that works. Pen and paper, crayons, watercolor, whatevs. Um, I would like students to access the four recordings of the four different overtures. Um, and uh, a website I use quite a bit is ISLP. It has all the scores that um, are for free. They're in public domain. My students really love doing score study. I teach at an urban middle school and they love it. They absolutely love it. High school kids dig it too. Everybody likes looking at the score. So I highly recommend that you go there. So to do this activity, read through the synopsis. And as you're reading through the synopsis of Fidelio, ask yourself, if you were to write a rescue opera, what would the story be? Who would need rescuing? Who would be the rescuer? Write a sketch of your plot and develop your cast. It can be people that exist in modern times. It could be your dream cast. The sky's the limit. Like we've been saying all morning, there's a, well, it's morning for me, I'm in California. Um, the sky's the limit. 
reading primary sources. So what I love, well, there's lots of things I love about teaching. We don't got time for that. But um, I love teaching these operas because of the stories and because of the history. And I love giving my students the backstory. And this particular opera has a lot of backstory. When Beethoven wrote this, he had a lot going on. Um, I would, on the on the website, in the resources, there's always this beautiful timeline that Dr. Kamala makes. And um, it's so powerful to know what's happening historically and it really ties everything in together. Um, the biggest thing that was going on with him was he was losing his hearing. Have students read two letters of Beethoven. The Heilige Stadt Testament, I cry every time I read this. These letters were found after he died and it was a letter to his brothers talking about his deafness. It, if you've never read it, I highly recommend it. Um, and then there's the letter to the Immortal Beloved. We don't know who the Immortal Beloved is. Um, it happened around 1812. Like I said, he had a lot going on, but he ends this letter with ever thine, ever mine, ever ours. Um, there's a really cheesy movie that came out in the 90s. Gary Ullman plays Beethoven. It's a goofy movie, which I love. I know we all have time for goofy movies right now. Um, deepening art inquiry. So um, I'm because we're running short of time. I'm going to skip through this a little bit fast. Um, there are four versions of the overture. So Beethoven wrote this overture four different times in four different places in history for different premieres. He wrote a different overture. And what I'd like my students to do is compare these overtures and sort of rank them, see which one they like best and why. We've been doing a lot of writing about music and listening to music and what we think about things. And it's, it's really been very, very productive. Okay, I'm gonna peace out and hand it over to my fabulous colleagues. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you for listening. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Rescue no is such a strange genre, such a fascinating genre. I and spoiler alert, Beethoven needed rescuing, I think. I think Beethoven needed rescuing. And I was just about to say, I think we all need rescuing in a little way. And as I was reading, I remember when you sent me the activity and I thought, you know, if I could have somebody rescue me, what would they do? What, what do I really need to be rescued from right now? And if I could rescue somebody else, what would I be able to do? I was just going to say, knowing you, Kamala, I think you would be the rescuer. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. No sitting at the top of the tower waiting for a <laughs> to rescue me. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephanie. That All was fantastic. Right. Teachers, let us know what your kids' rescue operas turn out like. Uh, let's turn to our other Stephanie H in our program. Actually, one of several other Stephanie H's. We have a plethora of Stephanie H's, a panoply of Stephanie H's. Stephanie Hendricks from Bangor, Maine. Take it away. Hi friends. So I am, as you know, the resident humanities teacher, not the music teacher. And so I worked to create some humanities lessons for Fidelio. And um, in one of the reviews that I was reading, Beethoven's Fidelio is described as, quote, a musical monument to freedom. And I think what we need maybe now more than ever is healing and liberation. And I think the only way we can make that happen is if we recognize our own agency as teachers and as students and use our voices to speak truth, to speak our own truths and to speak truth to power. And there's also, I think, this recognition that by becoming proximate to others' truths, we can be not only transformed, but we can become better co-conspirators in the work of abolition. And that's where this activity was born. So for the humanities activity, students are invited to write a manifesto. The essential questions that I organize this activity around include 
how can people successfully achieve liberation from oppression and how are people transformed through their relationships with others? I think those two questions are really, really important, particularly for this opera because Leonora, a noble woman who like dresses up as a man and who masquerades as Fidelio makes some really significant personal sacrifices to liberate her husband who's being held as a political prisoner and, um, you know, she takes some really serious personal risk to fight against oppression and to save him. And even as she seeks his freedom, she risks her own. And I think there's something very real and very timely about that particular story. So students are invited to write these manifestos. For the first part of the activity, they're invited to do some work with the synopsis and uh, to really think about the extent to which justice is being served by Florestan's imprisonment and what his crime actually is, and to think about what the boundaries of love and sacrifice actually are, and how those values motivate characters to take personal risks, and sort of the extent to which love can conquer all. Um, in step two, students are invited to look at some excerpts of the libretto and to do some intense character analysis and really look at motivations and think about the characters' hopes and dreams. That's going to help them in the manifesto writing activity if they can know where these characters stand and what they stand for and what they hope for. There's also a section where students are invited to examine mentor texts to learn about manifestos as a genre, like what is a manifesto? How do you write one? What does it look like? And there are all kinds of different examples that I've pulled from liberation movements and from businesses. There are some poetic manifestos. There are some artistic manifestos So uh, and historical manifestos too. So students have a lot of opportunities to really think about what is a manifesto? How does it work? How do you write one? And then they get a chance to write their own manifesto. Um, initially, they're invited to write a manifesto from the perspective of one of the characters in the opera, either Leonora Fidelio or Florestan's perspective. But students are also invited to write their own personal manifestos about the things that, that they stand for and that they value and um, sort of what they need liberation from to speak their own truth to power and to fight for freedom. And um, there's an extension activity as well that's sort of an additional step where uh, students are invited to broaden their own inquiry and look at some more modern movements for liberation and really think about people and organizations and movements as mentor texts. Like how can we study how other people have achieved freedom so that we can be better activists for our own and for others freedom. And so that's sort of the quick and dirty introduction to this, um, to this particular activity that, um, that I wrote and I, you know, I'm really, I'm excited for students to, to really think about these issues of abolition and freedom. And um, I think there's some additional opportunities too that if students write their own personal manifestos, depending on what format those take, they could even be set to music and performed. And I think that would be, that would be a really beautiful, beautiful thing for them to share. I'm so excited and I hope that you and your students really enjoy this activity. Second time I've not muted myself. That is so awesome. Thank you. All the ASL claps. I can't wait to, again, I can't wait to find out what kids come up with. What is it that this activity makes them discover about who they are, about the time we're living in, about their relationship to literature and artistic movements and social movements and, and history. Um, so thank you, that is beautiful. I love your activities so much. Thank you for joining us yeah. um, and we will see you soon. And finally, Dr. Emily Sines, 
Um, we are now making a not too sharp turn from Fidelio to Fille de Regiment. I'm not going to do a little tap dance about what this opera is. <laughs> we did it about a year and a half ago with the, um, the 1819 season of the HD Live in Schools program. Um, and you know what? As you explore it, you're going to find out all about it. But let me just say, if you're on the fence about doing this opera, it is hilarious, it is accessible, and it is hands down some of the finest singing I have ever heard on the Met stage. So take it away, Dr. Sines. Thanks so much. I'm so glad to be here, you guys. Uh, this opera is a fabulous starter opera. So any of your kids who've never been before, please encourage them to watch this one. Um, I am the head choir director at a 6 through 12 campus in Fort Worth ISD. So I see 12 year olds in the morning and 18 year olds in the afternoon. And it's one of the coolest things about my job. Um, this opera, uh, when we saw it two years ago, spoke to them at all ages and I love it. Um, I got to write two activities for this opera. The first one, which I will not be telling you too much about today, um, kind of appeals to the hilarity of the opera itself. It's a study of the history of lederhosen and the students get to create their own lederhosen with found objects around their house and then do a little fashion show. Um, and I'm with all of our activities, we're looking for things that kids can engage in and enjoy, be they at home or in person on campus. So that's a really great one and it, and it speaks a lot to the humor and the levity of this opera. Um, the activity I want to talk to you a little bit about today is a uh, poetry writing um, activity. I am a choir director, as I mentioned. We do a lot of poetry study in my classroom, but I have found that I'm a little intimidated about writing activities because I'm a music teacher. I am not a writing teacher. Um, this poem has been used in multiple ways in my classroom and in my personal life that I want to share with you today, um, and it ties in so beautifully to this uh, particular opera. Um, as I'm sure many of you are, I am always looking for vehicles that encourage empathy and understanding and self-knowledge. And uh, this poem is one of the things that encourages that. And for our students who are learning and growing how they're learning how to be empathetic, there is no easier way than to teach them how to empathize with a character in an opera first so they can practice before they have to practice on real people who are really complicated. Um, so I'd like to start by sharing, um, this is the text to a piece uh, named Truth. Uh, the composer of the SSA choral work is Andrea Ramsey. She's a living composer. She's incredible. The text of this piece, which I have here, I hope you'll take a second to read, is all about who you are, where are your roots, where are you from, and what are your dreams. And this is a piece that my uh, varsity high school treble choir is singing. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to tie operatic study, these incredible things that we do with the Met, into the studies that we do for actual performing arts pieces. I've always had a hard time with that disconnect. So this is a piece that my ladies are singing. Um, and so we began with the study of the poem of this choral work that we're singing. Um, I highly recommend reading it. Gardenia Bruce is really incredible. Then I had them read a poem um, that they knew was from an anonymous uh, poetry writer. They read the poem here. They do not know at this point in the lesson plan that I am the author of this poem. Um, and I had them break into teams um, and generate as much uh, marginalia as they can come up with about this uh, piece of poetry. What do we think about the poet? Is she female? Is she male? Is he male? Is the person white? Are they black? Are they Hispanic? How do you know? Are they old? Are they young? Um, and they had such a thoughtful uh, conversation about what they thought about the poet, again, without knowing that I was the one that wrote the poem. Um, I do feel that there is a divine intimacy in music making um, because it's a team sport. And um, in order to access the divine um, as the teacher, I feel that I must lead from the front. And so in an exercise like this, it means that I have to share my own self um, so that my students can then feel comfortable to share themselves with me. So that's why I start with sharing my own version of the poem. Then I let them know that I am the poet and we discussed what some of the symbology means in my own life and, and why I selected those images. Then they were given 
the template, which you see here on the screen, and this is in your Google Classroom for this activity. Uh, this template comes from a colleague that I work with, Mickey McCoy, and she is the head of our AVID department at Benbrook Middle High School, and she's a real treasure. So everybody receives this template, and I gave them um, some quiet, meditative time to fill this in. Um, in some ways, working on this template is easier when you're at your own house, because you can look around. The template's very specific, and we just talk about the importance of honesty um, as we're filling out this form. So they took some time to do that. Then they have a variety of options for sharing the poem that they have written. Number one is by anonymous submission. So I'll let them turn the poem in without their name on it for me to see that they that the work has been done. Um, and if they want it to be shared that with their name on it, they can put their name on it. Um, we use spoken word in class. We read a lot of poetry. When we study choral music, we always start with the poetry first. And so then I have those who want to share their poem, um, the, they can read their poem for the class, or if they would like it to be read anonymously, they can write anonymous and submit it to me and I can read it. They can also have a peer performance. So if they have a peer that they would like to read the poem for them, they can select someone or we can have kind of a blind grab for poems and everybody can choose one and not know who it's from and pack, practice having empathy by reading the words of their peers and colleagues, which is a very intimate experience. Um, to take it one step further, um, they can generate a little chord progression, write a little melody and sing their poem to the class. Um, some of us are more comfortable singing and find that to be an easier way to communicate than just reading our text. Um, we will be using this particular um, poem in a concert performance. So I like to um, loop our parents in as much as possible to the things happening in our classroom. And especially for parents who do not have positive musical ensemble experience in their history, they need to know that we do more than just sing. We teach literature, we teach literacy, um, we teach teamwork and kindness. And so by having students share their own poems in the choir concert, the parents are getting to see, oh, they're doing more in that class than quote, just singing. Um, I'm gonna throw things over here to my colleague, Tim, who's gonna show us how to tie this activity into Goose Chase. Tim. Hi, y'all. So I just, I put it in the uh, chat here and I'm gonna also put the PDF instructions as well um, in the chat, hopefully. If not, um, it's being slightly a pain, but we're gonna email to you and it's also in the doc. So let me really, really quick to just share my screen for- Send me all of this, second. Tim, and we will email it around to everybody as soon as we're done here. For sure. The biggest thing, so on your, you're gonna get these instructions page. We would love for you all to complete this goose chase um, throughout this week. And so it's very, very clear instructions, but the biggest thing here is uh, number one, two, three. I really highly recommend you do this as a guest. Uh, that's the quickest and easiest way to get started. The game code there, the password's there. We're gonna have so much fun. This is a great thing. We're connecting a lot of these other things that you've heard today. Uh, and I'm really excited to see what you have to submit. So have fun. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. That was so speedy. Um, so that is, uh, so Goose Chase is a really great way for students to um, to share the, the visuals associated with the poem about where they are from and, and what they believe and what they enjoy and what makes them who they are. Um, so that tells you a little bit about how to link that poem to something that's happening in your classroom that has nothing to do with the Met. Now let's figure out how to tie it to opera. So after the students have read your poem, written their own poem and shared deeply with one another. And by the way, make sure in whatever vehicle you're gonna use for sharing that students are aware and reminded of um, the manners surrounding sharing, which is that we're kind, we don't have cell phones out, um, we don't laugh at one another, um, our room is a safe space for sharing. And if your room is a music classroom, if your room is, it was a core classroom, safety in the classroom, emotional safety is really, really important, especially in a, the time that we are in. I will say from um, past experience as just a warning that the work on this poem has brought forth more than one conversation with a student where they were able to share some things that were going on in their personal life, which then necessitated a contact with a counselor on campus. Um, so just be aware that this can kind of um, 
you know, be the uncorking of a bottle of things that students might be holding in their hearts. Um, and also make sure you are familiar with the guidelines for contacting CPS, just in case. So back to the opera. Um, so now we're going to connect the same poetry prompt to La Fille du Regiment. So Fille, as we know, is humorous and lighthearted, but most opera, I would say 99% of it, is a double-sided coin. We have hilarity and sadness and grief and delight right next to each other in an operatic score, just as we do in life. And so um, I, I like this exercise for La Fille because the character of Marie, though she is humorous and lighthearted, she's struggling with who she is and where is she from and who is are her parents and why did they leave her behind and what does that mean for her future? So we then go back through and use the same poetry prompt to write the poem again, this time as the character of your choosing. This vehicle is great for any opera, truly. You can do this for anyone. I've done it here. You can see on the screen, this is my poem. And I did it as Marie. And I did it after watching the broadcast. And as I watched it, I just jotted down things. She's got an iron. I hear metal. I see mud on boots. And then I worked them into my poem. So I encourage you to do that. Um, I just want to share with you, this is not to do with La Fille, but just how um, Tim and I are communicating with people in our district. Number one, um, I have a, a Benbrook Bobcat Choir website, which you're welcome to visit, benbrookbobcatchoir.com, where I communicate with all the adult humans in the lives of my students and with my administrators and fine arts team so they know what's going on in our classroom. And I have an opera page on that website. So it's very easy to just find all the details, um, especially as our parents were just becoming comfortable and familiar with the going to the movie theater process. And now we're changing things up again. So I have found the opera page on my website to be really helpful for parents to understand what an incredible resource their children are getting access to. Um, I would strongly encourage you to make that password protected if you are going to post the login information for the Met account on there because we don't want those Met logins to be made public. Um, the other thing that I do um, every six weeks is I made a very dorky um, opera educator newsletter called The Rich to Teeth. Um, for those of you that know opera, you know that The Rich to Teeth is the part of the opera where all the action and all the big things are happening, as opposed to the aria where we talk about feelings. So The Rich to Teeth is short, sweet, and to the point all the things that the educators in our district need to know about what's coming up with our partnership with the Met. So I just try and preface them and keep them um, looped in and I send those out to the educators. Then I take little snapshots of the rich to team and I put it in the newsletter that I have for my choir program so that parents can have access to that. Finally, these are other places that I help my students gain access to their very own Met Opera login accounts. Um, so I made this lovely flyer here on the left-hand side. Shout out to Canva. It's amazing. Um, and that's so that, so that students can see. I posted this little flyer um, on the Google Classroom. I'm sending it out of a remind. It's in the newsletter. It's on the website. It's on the Google sites. So that parents have a thousand different ways to help their student log in. Um, and then in class on Friday, um, we practiced. So every student practiced logging into their account and they each got to dig around and see what they could find and practice hitting play and making sure that they could see those subtitles and everything. Um, I strongly encourage uh, those in the Met Education Partnership to do that, give them as many opportunities as possible to practice that login. Um, thank you so much for having me, you all. I really appreciate you and all this information and the activities that um, I've spoken about today will be coming at you here in the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emily. Can I have all of our teachers turn their cameras on for one second? We're just going to all give you a big <laughs> whoosh. Okay. Three, two, one. Whoosh. whoosh. You've earned it. Thank you all. You're all incredible. I'm so, like I said, I'm so honored and humbled to be part of this community of educators and opera fans. All right, I am going to throw things back to Susan. The rest of us are going to say farewell. And thank we you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamala Schelling and all you beautiful, fantastic, inspiring teachers. They're amazing. We're talking about them as if they can't hear us. You're amazing. You're all right. amazing. Mwah. Mwah.
I'm going to whoosh you all goodbye. And we just have a moment left. And I want to take a moment just to wrap up first, a little bit of housekeeping. If you haven't completed your license agreement for Met Opera On Demand, you should email, you should have this from Dan, but if that doesn't sound familiar, email Dan right away, dmarshall at Met opera.org. We hope that you'll join us next Saturday, October 17th, when we're going to, oh, next, you thought this Saturday was great. Next Saturday, we're going to be talking Akhenaten with Anthony Roth Costanzo and Richard Parkinson, professor of Egyptology at Oxford and former curator at the British Museum. Come on, virtual conference. We'll also be talking, this is this is the silver lining of a virtual conference. We'll be talking with famed director Peter Sellers. We're going to be talking about Dr. Atomic, myth and culture. And we had a conversation with him to prepare for this. His thoughts on being a teacher during this time are really something. So we hope you'll um, zoom in for that. And of course, we'll be sharing more curriculum to bring opera to life. So uh, just a few things I wanted to share before we go. Um, at 10 a.m. on October 21st, 2019, Kenyatta Hughes exited a New York state prison after 24 and a half years of being incarcerated. And at 6 p.m. that evening, he performed at Carnegie Hall. The day is beautifully captured in a short film called First Free Note by Sean Gallagher. And people can see it on Kenyatta's website, kenyattaemmanuel.com. It is gorgeous and the story is gorgeous. His music is gorgeous. His singing is gorgeous. And I highly recommend it. Would you now please shut your eyes? Again, you know I love a good eye shutting. Shut your eyes. And I want you to consider what possibility you're going to take away from our time together. Did you hear something today? Did someone say something that sparked possibility in you? Distill it down to one word. Open your eyes and I invite you to go back to menti.com, but we're going to use a different code this time. I'm going to pop, the, there's the codes already in the chat. Thanks, thanks Tim Brendler. Go to menti.com and would you please enter that one word that captures what you're going to take away from our time together today. What piece of possibility, listening, oh, fascinating. What piece of hope, more, <laughs> belonging, storytelling, community, Ooh, inclusion, yes. The mentee is hopping. I love this, tools, compassion, future, gorgeous, warmth, love for all, hopeful. Oh, I love the mentee. It's so fun. Engagement, humanity, stillness. Yes, Joyce DiDonato, breath, togetherness. I love it so much. Um, in discussions, I had a discussion recently over Zoom with Tim Brendler and Michael Groff, and Michael said, the question isn't how can we best approximate what we've done before? The question is, what can we do now that we have never done before? And I just have carried that with me in my heart. And I just want to sing it into your hearts, but nobody wants to hear me sing. So I want to thank you, friends. Keep a lookout for your Zoom registration link for the next Saturday's conference. Note that next week, we're going to be in a traditional Zoom meeting format. So we'll be able to see each other's faces. And I just want to quickly welcome back our Met Ed team so that we can wish you goodbye. Marsha, Dan, Kamala, please reveal yourselves. Hey. We look forward to seeing all of your faces next week. Um, before we whoosh, I want to say this. Hannah asked if we could play uh, the end of Kenyatta's composition in light of the conversation that we heard and what he talked about in terms of how when he got to composing the end of that work, he, he felt differently than he did at the beginning of that composition. 
And we just wanted to give you an opportunity to listen again in light of that conversation. So we're going to play that in its entirety to take us out. But before we go, we just want to wish you goodbye on behalf of Marsha Drummond and Dan Marshall, Kamala Schelling, and myself, Susan Blackwell. We send you the biggest whoosh of love. Thank you. One, two, three. Whoosh. Oh.